All right, so we're at 1202, so we can get started. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jake. I'm the Senior Education Coordinator here at the Waterfront Alliance. Uh, we are a bi-state organization focused on proving the shared waterways and waterfronts throughout New York and New Jersey. Uh, so for 2023 Climate Week, uh, Waterfront Alliance is centering on critical climate resilience issues facing New York City and New Jersey uh, through a se series of webinars and roundtable discussions, art exhibits, boat tours, and many more. Uh, we welcome you to visit our website and the Climate Week website to learn more about our events this week. Uh, so today's webinar is entitled More Plastic Than Fish in the Harbor, How We Can Collectively Reduce Plastic Waste and Consumption. Um, our facilitator, Jennifer Coffey, is the executive director of the Association of New York, uh, excuse me, New Jersey Environmental Commissions, uh, and we'll discuss the crisis of the plastic, of plastic consumption, its impact on our lives, ecological systems, and solutions that are being presented today. Uh, following the presentation, uh, we will split into breakout groups and facilitate a roundtable discussion where we'll share what we're doing to address the plastic issue, um, identify opportunities for collaboration while gauging interest in establishing a formal working group to regularly convene around this topic. Um, during this facilitation, we'll also use a Jamboard and split into breakout groups. Um, so now, <clears throat> I'm honored to introduce Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer joined uh, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, or ANJEC, in uh, July 2014 as the Executive Director. Uh, she serves as a member of the New Jersey State Water Supply Advisory Council and as an advisor to the New Jersey State Clean Water Council. Uh, she serves as a member of the Hamilton Township Planning Board on the Advisory Board for the School Conservation uh, Rutgers University Climate Change Alliance Steering Committee, and as a member of the New Jersey Society of Women Environmental Professionals. Um, she also serves on numerous New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Advisory Stakeholder Task Forces for climate change, water quality, flooding, equitable access to open space. Really, she does it all. Uh, so <clears throat> without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Jennifer to share her slides. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate that. And thank you for having me here at Climate Week. It's wonderful to be able to speak about plastics during Climate Week. A lot of people don't get the connection, but I know you guys do. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to talk about the successes and challenges we've had in New Jersey and share them with New York. And you guys have had a lot of successes and challenges of your own. Um, and as the most densely populated area in our country, we can certainly have a lot of pull and sway um, on reducing plastic pollution and really climate change. So let's let's get into it. Thank you again. Um, we'll move to the, the next slide. And as I said, uh, my name is Jennifer Coffey and I lead a nonprofit organization called the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. Um, the slides don't look like they're advanced. There we go. Uh, and we are a nonprofit organization that focuses on helping communities make good decisions about the environment uh, for our environment and for their own communities. And one of the issues that came to our attention several years ago is when um, EPA, then EPA Administrator uh, Judith Ank from EPA Region 2 under the Obama administration, located right there in New York, called me and said, hey, Jen, are you tired of picking up other people's trash yet? And I said, what are you talking about, Judith? And we do all these stream cleanups. We do beach sweeps, beach cleanups, park cleanups. And it feels like we're picking up the same trash year after year. The trash just keeps coming back. And this is a gross underestimation of the amount of plastic that goes into our oceans every year. We don't have a good, accurate upper threshold number, but we know that at a minimum, we've got about 9 million tons of plastic entering our oceans every year. And one of the challenges that we have here is that um, some people say, well, that's not in America. That's uh, China's a big part of the problem. India's a big part of the problem. Thailand's a big part of the problem. Yeah, the plastics rattling around in China are probably the Gatorade bottle that I drank in high school. So it, it's really a global problem and we ship our trash around. What has happened in recent years, actually during the pandemic is China, India, Indonesia, Thailand have said, you know what, America, we're not taking your crap anymore. We're not taking your trash. We don't, we don't want your money. We don't want your garbage. 
And so now we've got an issue with where do we put this stuff? We can't push it off on those who have um, less well-built systems than we have. So let's go to the next slide. So that's part of the problem. Um, we've all seen the pictures of the turtles with the straw up their nose, with the, the whales that you cut open their gut and they're full of plastic. We know this, we know there's a problem. The World Economic Forum tells us that by 2050, for every one pound of fish out there, there'll be a pound of plastic. So we are careening towards a future where we will have more plastic than fish in our waterways. And certainly that's a problem for a whole lot of reasons. Um, the good news there is that we can stop it. This is a human made problem. We caused this problem, we can fix this. So the caveat on the more plastic than fish in our waterways by 2050 is that if we don't do something about it. So if you think back to Dr. Seuss and you think back to um, the Lorax, it's, that's the big if or the big unless somebody does something, unless somebody cares a whole awful lot. So let's go to the next slide. Why are we talking about plastics? Because of climate change. And that's one of the reasons why I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Plastics are fossil fuels, plain and simple. They are fossil fuels. And the fossil fuel industry is incredibly creative and incredibly well-funded. Um, I laugh because of the amount of money that they have to put into campaigns to keep their industry going. So we know that there's a lot of concern about shutting down fossil fuels as a fuel source. And we talk about that in, in lots of different ways when we discuss renewable energy and greenhouse gases and um, changing climate and increasing flooding and increasing drought. But the other issue is that they are ingenious at taking their byproducts, so their, their ethane and converting it to ethylene. And they do that in these cracker plants or cracking plants to create uh, hard plastics. And so plastics are increasingly becoming, if you look at their economic forecasting, they're increasingly becoming an important component of the fossil fuel industry's bottom line. As we look to move away from fossil fuels towards electric vehicles, towards more renewable resources, they're not gonna just give up their business and say, oh, well, we had a good run, we're done. They're gonna fight and plastics is really their fight. Let's go to the next slide. So plastics are really at the intersection of water quality and habitat issues, um, food issues with regard to fish, climate change, and environmental justice. Because as I mentioned, when you take ethane, so when you're, you're, you're mining for fossil fuels, whether it's oil or more frequently now gas, um, with gas, you get a whole lot of different product. You get butane for lighters, you get propane, think about your grill, you get methane, for your gas stovetop. Your gas stovetop is methane. That's what you're burning when you're cooking with gas in your kitchen. And you also get ethane. And um, any number of these components can be converted into other things. What's currently happening is they take the ethane component of this and convert it to ethylene. And they do that in a high heat environment to crack the molecules. Hence, we call them cracker plants or cracking plants. And so those cracking plants or cracking plants are not being located on the Upper East Side. They're not being no located in Morristown, New Jersey or Princeton, New Jersey. They're being located in communities that often have less ability and less resources, less time, language barriers, less money to hire high powered attorneys to fight back. Well, why do we care if ethane is converted into ethylene? Because it produces a toxic soup of emissions. And so you have cancer causing emissions that are coming out of this cracking process that lead to um, additional breathing problems. Um, they may lead to long-term problems with other organs. So um, they're cancer causing issues, carcinogen issues, as well as acute issues of breathing. So we've got water quality issues, we've got food issues and habitat issues. We have climate change and we've got environmental justice. So plastics really are at the nexus of so many of the environmental issues that we're concerned about and fighting against. Let's go to the next slide. 
And I'd like to thank uh, Judith Ank from Beyond Plastics. Uh, again, I said she was with EPA Region 2 under the Obama administration for allowing me to use many of these slides. So in the next slide, I believe we're going to look at uh, the situation as we have it in New Jersey. Now, New York and New Jersey share a lot of the same issues. Our slides don't seem to be advancing, but I'm just going to roll with it and hopefully we'll catch up. Uh, in New so in New Jersey, uh, we have a long history, as I'm sure you do in New York as well, of um, doing these spring and fall cleanups. So you're in a park, you're along a beach, you're on your roadside, you get the scouts groups, the garden clubs, and you go and you clean up trash. And what we found is that there are some pretty common items that we're picking up in our trash. And the most common for New Jersey, when looking back at 30 to 50 years worth of data, depending if you're talking about beaches or roadside cleanups, is uh, or were plastic bags, straws, and polystyrene food containers. That's today. And so when our environmental commissioners in New Jersey, and we work with about 300 different communities, started saying, look, you know, we're also getting tired of picking up other people's trash. What can we do to, to fix this problem? Um, Judith, an opportunity for many of us from New York, from New Jersey, from Chicago, from California, from New Orleans, to get together virtually um, before it was commonplace and share our concerns with plastic. And what we did was said, okay, well, let's target the most common items. And for New Jersey, that was plastic bags, straws, and polystyrene containers, so styrofoam, essentially. And we said, let's do what we can to try to eliminate that at the source. So we started talking to the New Jersey legislature, and we can go to the next slide. And there was some interest among environmental champions to reduce plastic pollution. This is at the height when, if you remember, the National Geographic cover looked like a um, an iceberg, but it's really a plastic bag floating in the water. When we had the viral images of the turtles with the the straw up their nose, and so we said, let's let's talk about this. While industry being well funded, and I'm talking about the Chemistry Council, I'm talking about the fossil fuel industry, and and everyone associated with that, um, got ahead of us. Did I mention they have more money than the environmental advocates? So they got ahead of us. They got into the governor's office. They negotiated a plastic reduction bill and got it passed through the legislature very fast. And it landed on Governor Murphy's desk. And many of us who were doing this work that's hard and slow and were less well-funded went, oh, my God, this bill is awful. It's a do-nothing bill. It's a greenwashing bill. It's a big old nothing burger. It looks like they're doing something, but they're not. So we were able to work with Governor Murphy's office and convince him to veto it. So he did. And we said, okay, now let's work on a real bill. Let's work on something that will make real change in New Jersey as the most densely populated state, as the state that's known for petro and chemical refinery. Let's, let's strike out and do something real. And our champions in the legislature came back and said, no, there's no appetite for this right now. We did a bill and you got Murphy to, to kill it. So we're not going to, we're not going to do it again. And I said, Oh God, you got to be killing me. You're, you're killing me here. And so in speaking in more detail with Senator Smith, who is the chair of our Senate environment energy committee here, who is a real champion, he said, you got to go local. And he said, come back to me in a few years. And I said, I'll see you in six months. And he said, no, I'm telling you, this is going to be a hard fought community by community. And I said, I hear you. I will see you in six months. We'll have a conversation. And he said, OK, like and just kind of you know laughed and chuckled. So in six months, um, we came back and we had 50 local ordinances passed. And how did we do that? Because Anjak is in a position of holding an annual environmental Congress. Um, it's a conference we call environmental Congress. And we set out the task and said, here's your model ordinance. Here's your education kit, go get them, get local ordinances for us. And we targeted key districts and we have 50, 50 ordinances and we held press conferences and we got to 75, we put out press releases. We got to hundred, we held three press conferences and we got to the point where the legislature couldn't ignore us. So inside of 18 months of relaunching, we had a real state bill that would make a difference. And 
um, we had originally estimated that these 130 ordinances out of 565 municipalities in New Jersey saved 400 million single-use plastic bags annually. And we thought, well, that's pretty good. Let's go to the next slide. And when we were finally able to get a real bill, because we were then at the negotiating table and we targeted bags, we targeted straws, and we targeted polystyrene, again, because driven by the data, this is what we're finding most often in our environments when we're doing um, cleanups. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we were able to do a whole lot more. And this bill had a phased in approach of when we started eliminating or using straws upon request. So you have to ask for a straw in New Jersey. It works in some places, it doesn't work as well in others. So we're, we're going for progress here. We don't yet have perfection, but we're working on it. Um, and that was because we heard members of the disability community who said, we really, some of us need to have straws in terms of when we're going out to eat and don't make us prove our disability. Um, so it was an equity issue and we heard that. There was a polystyrene issue in terms of um, restaurants and distributors who already had a glut of this stuff and they said we're going to lose massive amounts of money and we're just going to throw it out if that's what you make us do so we said fine we'll do a phased in approach uh let's go to the next slide so we heard it, some of the the concerns um i also spent more time in my life than i ever thought was possible really honestly possible talking about stitched reusable bags versus glued reusable <laughs> bags. So anybody who wants the inside to that arcane um, conversation, you can email me or we can go out for a glass of wine and talk about that. But the kind of bags you're using and making sure that they're truly durable and not just a greenwashed product is incredibly important. And this is where talking to others, which is why this forum is so important, became genius. We were able to talk to California uh, because Judith Ank has put us in touch with them and realized that the chemistry council out there, the fossil fuel industry said, look, we, we don't make anything that looks like that. So if you just ban this certain type of plastic bag, you'll be fine. And the next week they came out with a thicker plastic bag. So now they're using more plastic in California for their single use bag or for their reusable plastic bags. And so we were able to say, look, we we see your argument that you're trying to make in New Jersey and we raise you a California and that's why we're not going to do that here. And we were able to write a stronger law here that says no plastic film in New Jersey. Just no. California, you can have thicker plastic film. They're still working to try to unwind that. But we were able to learn through community forums about what the industry was doing, um, the fossil fuel industry, and get ahead of them. Because the fossil fuel industry and the plastic industry and the chemistry council, they're all the same. Let's go to the next slide. And I wanna talk um, just for a second about compliance and enforcement. This is the real key and it's on the local level. So the, the issue here really is about education, education, education until people get tired of it and then we educate them some more. And so really letting them know what's going on and talking to the big companies about it. Do we have perfection? No. Our environmental commissioners perfectionists, yes. So we've got tattletales everywhere who are trying to get compliance. We've got vast improvement, again, not perfection, but vast improvement in New Jersey. Let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna to try to keep us on time here and get to what we've learned in the past year plus. Um, we'll skip this one. Um, that basically just says all those local ordinances, I think we got up to about 150 ordinances before we got a state law in place, are now superseded by the state law, which is fine because the state law is stronger than a lot of those local ordinances. Um, how do we know what we're doing and if it's working? Well, we've got a plastic advisory council and we've got some really good people seated there. Um, lucky enough to have a staff member from ANJAC that serves on this plastic advisory council. And so the idea here is, is the law working and how can we make it better? No law that changes the world substantially is right on the first go. Think about all the changes we've had to make to healthcare or social security. Clearly this is not that big of a piece of legislation, but it has ginormous impacts. So it takes a little bit of time and it may take a revision here and there to get things um, to be even, even better than where they are. Next slide. And I think this is where we get to the one year of, we'll just skip this one. That's our website, um, New Jersey No Plastics, where you can get more information. So the one year report that came out end of May. So this is one year, after the law went into effect. We saw 
fewer plastic bags, 39% fewer plastic straws, 37% less poly, uh, polystyrene foam waste. So that's about 40% of each of those across the board that we're seeing less of in doing stream cleanups, beach sweeps. So that's, that's a big improvement that we're seeing. Furthermore, the plastic bags, the straws, and the foam were always in the top 10, the, you know, the dirty list that you get of most common items. They've all fallen out of that top 10 now. So there are other things that we can go after and, and find. So we're seeing reductions. We know the law is working. Does somebody still get a plastic bag every day somewhere at some bodega or deli in New Jersey? Sure. But en masse, it is working. And the estimate now is that, and this kind of blows my mind because it's 8 billion with a B, less, fewer single use plastic bags in one year, just in New Jersey. So the 9.2 million or so people that we have in New Jersey, now 8 billion less plastic bags. So this is why these laws can be really impactful in densely populated areas like New York City, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, LA, because you get a big bang for your buck. And when you get that big bang for your buck, the industry feels it. The support is slightly waning as, um, as evidenced by the last Monmouth University poll. So that's something that makes me concerned and makes me wanna do more education and feel good videos and let people know that this is actually working. We did a lot of work um, explaining to the public why this needed to happen. And now I think we need to explain to them that it's working and that they're part of the environmental champions. And so um, that, that's something for me to pay attention to next year and make sure that we get the success story out there. Let's go to the next slide. I think I can wrap this up in the next two minutes or so. All right, this is the next big one, which is more difficult to talk to the public about. So if there are any communications people out there who've got some brilliant minds on this, I'd, I'd love to chat with you on it. So we talked about bans, right? That's easy you understand a plastic bag because it's in your kitchen. You got a bag full of bags right now. We all have bag fulls of reusable bags, but everybody's had a bag full of bags. This law, this recycled content law will have even bigger impacts, but it's harder to talk to the public about the bigger impacts are because we are shifting the macroeconomics of recycling. We have a lot of environmental commissioners who talk to us, you gotta fix recycling, they tell us. And we go, yeah, we don't really know what that means. And so we figured out what that means here in that the recycling bin that you have in your kitchen or your office or in the hallway, you take it out to a larger bin, a dumpster, somebody comes and collects it and you hope it goes to a better place, right? You hope something good happens from it. You wish it well on its way. Well, in the past, it went to China, India, Indonesia. You know, my Gatorade bottle from high school is still rattling around somewhere in China or India. And that's that's a problem become, because it becomes somebody else's waste product. It's a waste to deal with. Well, in New Jersey, what we're requiring now is that new plastic materials need to be made from old plastic materials. So it takes your recycling bin in your kitchen, in your hallway, in your office, and instead of it becoming a problem, a waste problem, it becomes a commodity and it becomes something that industry then seeks to have because they need it to be able to then create new plastic out of it. Now, if you go to your corner store and you buy a Snapple or a Coca-Cola, you'll see that they're already on that train. They're already making new plastic out of old plastic. And this is the holy grail for environmentalists, right? We talk about closed loop sustainable systems. This is how we're getting there. And so I was over the moon thrilled when New Jersey was the first out of the gate with this. We're the first in the nation to pass a law like this. California picked it up a few months after we did, uh, after we passed it and adopted an an even more aggressive timeline compliance schedule. So you now got California six, world largest economy. So a behemoth in and of their own right in terms of their impact on the industry because of the amount of people they have and the amount of commerce that they do. And you've got New Jersey, the most densely populated state in the nation, small, but we're scrappy. So you've got the two of us together now leading the industry to say, you've got to make new plastic out of old plastic because we're done with this virgin fossil fuel stuff. So we're cutting right in at the bottom line of the fossil fuel industry. So there's some details here on it. I won't go through the particulars. 
Um, what is it? It it's not everything, but it's the biggies again. We're going for the big things: the the rigid plastic containers, the takeout food containers, the the Coke, the Pepsi, the Snapple, the Dasani bottles, um, any plastic trash bags, contractor bags, leaf bags. Um, so it's the most common plastic items. And somebody come to me and say, we need to deal with those little things that they put in your Starbucks cup that keep your coffee warm. And I say, from a volume perspective, those aren't on my radar yet. I hear you. Yes, I understand. But we're, we're going for the big things that we can have an impact on. Um, what does it affect? What you sell in New Jersey, what you produce in New Jersey, what you import in New Jersey. Um, are there exemptions? Of course, there always are medical issues. Um, your food truck, your small independent cupcake shop. You know, we're, we're not trying to kill small business here. We're not trying to be a pain in the neck. We're trying to swing the pendulum here to make a difference. Um, so that's that's where we are. That starts in January. We will have our first year compliance report. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, in January 2025, I will tell you that, um, and you guys probably know better than I do, and I am wrapping up, I promise, your uh, Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, I think there's 11 different chapters, are interested in this concept. They want more information about how the compliance is going to happen and how the company is going to manufacture plastic out of plastic. Um before they really commit to setting forward on this, but they are interested. We would love, 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 love to have New York City join New Jersey and California because the density of your population and the educated constituency you have, I think get it and could really help swing. So what does this do? This is our compliance schedule here. So there's a ramping up, you see. We start with a low bar and we go, we escalate up over time as to how much plastic, how much old plastic you need to use to make new plastic. Why do we care about New York City, New Jersey, and California? Because we can bypass Congress. We can change plastic manufacturing in New Jersey and create more sustainable closed loop systems without having national legislation. Because if you get enough people to do it, Industry just says, fine, we're going to do this for everybody because they don't want the New Jersey, New York, California standard, and then the Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, you know, everybody else standard. They just want to do it. So if you get the most densely populated areas and we swing, then they have to come with us because it's a, it's a matter of business efficiency for them. Let's go to the next slide. And this is really wrapping it up. So what's next? Um, in the new legislative session that starts about mid-January for us, we're going to talk about a combination of those first three, extended producer, uh, producer responsibility, um, which also has a plastics incineration ban. There's all kinds of fancy words now for burning plastic. Uh, and the most common one is pyrolysis, which sounds you know, very chemistry forward. It's burning plastic. It's not good. Where are they going to burn it? Not on the Upper East Side, not in Montclair, not in Princeton. They're going to burn it in areas where people have less ability to fight back. They're going to burn it in low income black and brown communities, English or second language speaking communities. So these three kind of go together. We're, we're, we're noodling on some extended producer responsibility, packaging reduction. Amazon has started to hear us and they've started to scale back their packaging. We have too much packaging. <laughs> There's too much. So let's scale it back. And also a bottle a bottle bill. And I know you've got some, um, I think in, in upstate New York, you've got bottle exchange. I know Vermont has it, Massachusetts has it. So we're talking about it. There are some other issues that New Jersey communities get grants based on the tonnage of recycling that they receive on a municipal concept or a municipal load. So if you reduce that, the municipalities get less money. So we got to work out the math on where those programs integrate with one another, but we're noodling on that. Um, Balloon bans, that's always a good idea. We've seen a lot of people move away from the big balloon releases. So that's, again, we're looking for volume of impact. And so that's that's kind of fallen down on our list. And there is national legislation. Again, I, I don't, I'm a big history buff. I don't have a whole lot of faith in Congress these days. So if we can make an impact without having to go through Congress, then that's, that's the route I'm going to take at this point. We'll go to the next slide. And I think that's my last slide. Sorry, we're a couple minutes over. I'm gonna blame some of the tech there <laughs> um, on going in and out. So this is us, um, Amcheck. We are a nonprofit organization and we're run on donations because of people like you who um, like the work that we're doing and, and wanna be a part of the team. So that's where we are. My contact info is on the next slide. I know we're gonna 
maybe take a minute or two for questions. We'll see where we are on time. I'll let our moderators talk about that. Um, please follow us on social media. That's my personal email. I'm telling you the better way to get in touch with us is the info at Anjack because I get about 200 emails a day and I am just overwhelmed by them. So it's a good problem to have, but our staff um, monitor that info email very frequently. So that's that's the best way to get in touch with us. And of course on social media. So thank you for, for having me today. I hope that was that was useful. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I do want to take a few minutes for questions. Um, I know we're a little behind, but that presentation was phenomenal. And I'm sure tons of people have questions to ask. So I'm just going to dive right in and ask the first one here. Um, and feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, OK, so thanks for sharing this. Um, do you suppose the producers do you suppose that producers would become more involved in plastic waste collection? Can we expect a lowered burden on local government? Um, and this is in relation to knowing what changes you expect in terms of the disposal of plastics once the law is enacted in 2024. Yeah, the recycled content law. And so what we're hoping will happen, our, our you know best and highest hope, is that we will have additional support from industry with regard to encouraging recycling and understanding what can be recycled. Again, industry has a lot more money than local government, a lot more money than um, you know, a small nonprofit organizations. And so when they come in and start with corporate campaigns and you can get ads that air you know, during the middle of Grey's Anatomy, like you've kind of made it, right? So we need more education to make sure we're recycling the right things, you know, that aspirational recycling, ah, oh, throw it in there. Too much aspirational recycling ruins the whole load of recycled content and it becomes landfill material. So we need to get it right. And we're hoping they will do that because they need the materials. It becomes a commodity item for them to purchase back to then make new plastic out of it. They need to make new plastic out of old plastic. And um, so those are the kind of changes that we're hoping we will see. And by way of that, we'll get an increase in recycling rate and move towards a more closed loop um, community, um, you know, global community, ideally. So that's the, that's the grand master plan and we'll see how it works and we'll make tweaks along the way um, to make sure that it works. Excellent, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask? I'm not seeing any other questions come up. Um, so with that, I think we can, oh, sorry, one more question, and then we can move into our breakout group. So thanks for sharing, very interesting. I was wondering if you foresee more collaboration uh, with government and businesses in the recycling industry, uh, such as hard to recycle plastics, such as snack bags, beauty products, et cetera, similar to TerraCycle. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the, that's the goal. Uh, it's, I'm going to say it's, it's the, it's a little more of a far reaching goal. TerraCycle is great. I know they've had some, some press um, recently that illustrated perhaps why everything cannot be exactly recycled. Some things are not going to be able to be recycled and we've got to make them of materials that are more recyclable friendly, if you will. And so that's part of the recycled content law and the extended producer responsibility. Um, Judith Ank and Beyond Plastics is really leading the way in helping us understand what the dirty dozen in plastics are. So plastic, it's it's not just pure ethane goes to ethylene. It's, it's a combination of different plastics. And when you melt this down and chip it up and reformulate it, one of the things we need to make sure is that we have the chemistry right and we're not leading to leaching of um, chemicals that can cause health problems or environmental problems as we're making new plastic from old plastic. So hopefully some of those materials will become, um, will transform in terms of what they're being made of. That's kind of next level right now. So again, we're focusing on the bulk of things, um, the hard plastic containers, the plastic trash bags, um, glass containers as well of getting the majority. And then that's that's next level, if you will. 
Excellent. Oh, Thank yes. You. And let's let's have them not use plastic wrapping for all. That's part of the packaging reduction um, conversations that we're hoping. I mean, we've been having these conversations for 18 months. They're hard. They're hard conversations with industry with a lot of money that that bullies their way in. And get, like I said, getting the chemistry right on it, because some of this is is new, is also hard. Um, but it's easier to reduce packaging. And so that's part of what we're gonna pick up in January with the New Jersey legislature is let's just stop using so much of this stuff. Let's try to reduce on the reduce, reuse, recycle. Let's let's focus on the reduce portion of this. Excellent, thank you. I see a couple more questions came in, but I'd love to keep us on track. Um, so I think we're gonna shorten our time in the breakout rooms, but we're still gonna do them. So if we could get split into our breakout groups, uh, that would be great. And then Jennifer, did you want me to ask the questions or do you have them on hand? Uh, if you could ask them, that would be great. I, I think I have 70 windows open. <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll throw them in the chat and then I'll also um, throw right. them out for who's left. Perfect. So I think we're all back. Thank you all for who stayed on. Um, I know we're coming up on time, but we have just two more questions for you. Um, so let me throw them both into the chat and then just ask them to the group. So two questions. So would we like to continue meeting to exchange knowledge and best practices of what we're all doing around the use of plastics? And if so, how frequently should we continue to convene? And Jennifer, if you want to speak on this at all, yeah. also, and um, any like any experience that you've had with like having like yeah, regular meetings about this. I'll share that it was really useful to understand what the chemistry councils and the fossil fuel industry was doing in California when they passed their law and what happened in the implementation after it, because California allowed for a certain thickness plastic bag because the, the industry said it didn't exist and then they created it. Um, so to understand that, that kind of tomfoolery um, and be able to write a better bill was really important. And also um, we learned from talking to advocates in New York that there was a company um, in Germany who's got a subsidiary here in the States who wanted to allow for their thicker plastic bag to be used and to understand the strategy they used in lobbying the legislature and then looking for an exemption through your Department of Environmental Protection and then threatening a lawsuit. And then we were able to get a copy of the, the docket that they filed with the court and the reasons why the court threw it out. We were again, able to build a bigger, better boat to, you know, the better bill to, to put forward our our legislation and not have to, to worry about those challenges because we knew that we wrote it stronger than what had been done in other states or really held in the case of New York firm with New York's actions because the courts threw their their challenge out as nonsense. Um, so we were able to say, look, legislators, don't don't be don't be afraid of this. Look, New York stood up and um, so sharing those stories is really important because you can bet that industry is sharing their stories. Because again, plastics are the future of their economic bottom line. It may not be all of it, but it is a big component. And so they're meeting, they're talking. And for us to meet and talk is, is super useful. And I see one comment that um, says, yes, further meetups, conversations, updates would be great. Um, Excellent. Um, so I think we're we're just about at time. Um, I want to thank again everyone who stayed on um, and participated in the breakout rooms. I know in my group I got a lot of really fantastic information, so I really appreciate your contributions. Um, but yeah, thanks again for joining us today. Um, we'll have a follow up email with the recording of this um, for the presentation. And yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me for Climate Week. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Great to see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye, everyone.